Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we will have the tech talks here. Uh, there will be two. The first one will be given by Matthias, and the second one by Jochen, but he's still coming, so the timing might be a little close, uh, but we'll see. Uh, the first talk will be a juicy one, as it's about uh, hacking and uh, security. Uh, and Matthias, he will give the talk. He is a uh, a security officer at uh, Balwaz Insurance, and he will tell you a bit more about what for shell, what it is, uh, how it was fixed or mitigated, and what you can do in the future to prevent it. I give the stage to Matthias. Please give him a warm. Round of applause. So thank you, please. Uh, I'm indeed Matthias van Mel. Uh, I'm working as a security specialist for uh, Balwaz Insurance. Uh, in my current role, I'm actually as a technology security officer uh, within the CISO office. So this means that I'm focusing more on the technology and the technical aspects uh, within, in, related to cybersecurity within uh, Balwaz. Now today, I'm going to talk a bit about the log for shell vulnerability. Um, I'm first quickly going to explain what the lock for shell vulnerability is, uh, why it's such a big deal. Then we're going to dive deeper into the cyber kill chain, actually show you what a hacker could do to exploit this. And then further down, uh, explain how to defend against that. But also in the broader scale, how can we defend against supply chain attacks or um, attacks within our software supply chain. And then lastly, a segue into uh, secure development, uh, why this is all part of a bigger picture uh, called Versicos. So, uh, lock for shell or the fancy title there on top. So, in December uh, of last year, um, a vulnerability was detected uh, in, within the Apache lock for j library. So this is a dependency that is widely used uh, across many, many software components uh, across the world. Um, some of these statistics show that uh, 7,000 packages uh, directly uh, use this library, but even more, uh, 35,000 packages use it indirectly, meaning that you're nesting dependencies, and then one of the nested dependencies is this one for j library. Now the reason why this was such a huge was because of the first of all the, the type of vulnerability that this was. So this is remote code execution, meaning that you could trigger the server into running codes that you present towards the server. In most cases, also malicious code there. Therefore, the rating, uh, so the criticality of the vulnerability was also assigned to as a 10 out of 10, which is of course the maximum and really shows you what, uh, what the impact of this vulnerability. Again, because this impacts Java applications, uh, this means that potentially all operating systems are affected. And uh, because this is a dependency, it is used directly, indirectly, which makes it very hard to locate and to mitigate the vulnerability. And that's what uh, a lot of organizations were confronted with. They knew that there was a vulnerability, but they were not aware of whether they're impacted or not, or how they could even patch uh, the vulnerability when they were and then the worst of all, uh, there was a patch released very soon after the publication of the vulnerability, but unfortunately the patch didn't uh, actually cover the, the vulnerability itself, so it could still be exploited. So security experts, developers had to, had to, had to do a lot of rework uh, and basically do the patching all over again, uh, making it yeah, the, the time to patch longer and uh, yeah, having the vulnerability uh, open in the wild uh, a bit longer. That's of course not ideal. Now uh, we're gonna dive a bit into the cyber kill chain. So the, the kill chain, uh, that's a fancy word of saying that there's a certain methodology that typically hackers would use to exploit a vulnerability or a, a system. So in this case, you go all the way from reconnaissance to delivery exploitation, all the way to the actions that you want to take on your target, on your objective. And now we're going to translate that a bit into how that would uh, be used, uh, in this case for the lock for shell vulnerability. So first phase, uh, the reconnaissance phase. Uh, so this is where a hacker would typically yeah, do a lot of information gathering. Information in the broader sense of, uh, of the word can be everything. So everything you can find on Google, uh, social media, 
uh, the deep or dark web, but even also social engineering, just tricking people into releasing information that they actually shouldn't be able to, uh, to tell to everyone. And so that's uh, really defining the scope, your targets, uh, getting a big picture of, of the, the organization, of the specific targets that the hacker is trying to exploit. And then, of course, an important aspect also uh, getting a feel of the network uh, and performing some network scans. And so there, there is a common tool which is called Nmap, which is uh, basically the Swiss army knife of hackers. Uh, it gives you a lot of information of your target systems and it can be easily used to quickly identify vulnerabilities or running services in your, uh, on your target. So in this example, uh, I'll show you the, the, the syntax that would be used and what could potentially be, uh, be delivered as a, as a result of that scan. In this case, you see, for example, uh, port uh, 89 out of 83 is open and it's running the Apache Solar with uh, that version. And this is something that we can look into databases, we can look into vulnerability databases on this specific service on that version and we can see whether there are active vulnerabilities there. And in this case, we know, for example, that this is a piece of software, a component, a service that is vulnerable to the Log4j vulnerability and then we can try and exploit. So then, um, then we come to the weaponization phase. So we have identified a potential vulnerability, potential entry point, and that's where the hacker will need to create a payload. And the payload is basically the, the package uh, that you want uh, to send to your target, uh, and will, that will trigger the vulnerability and will uh, yeah, then exploit uh, what you're trying to do. So in this case, uh, there on top, we have for the vulnerability details that we received, we see that that's the basic payload that we should send to the target. And now if we run a couple of tests, so what we try to do here typically is uh, get a reverse shell connection. So have the target create a shell or trigger an interaction towards our server. So this we, we can trust basically with um, basic HTTP requests trick the server into, um, into connecting to our, to our machine. And if we see with this example that the connection comes back and the connection is received, that confirms that this specific vulnerability is actually vulnerable and that the log4j library is uh, vulnerable. Now for weaponization, uh, of course the, the exploit itself, it works over the, the LDAP protocol, which is uh, a bit more sophisticated, but there again, uh, as well as the, the normal open source community, the hacker community also has a lot of open source tools and, and hacking tools that can be used as well. And in this case, we can easily use an open source repository to create an LDAP request uh, or LDAP referral server. And in essence, uh, this basically means that we are just compiling a piece of Java code that will again, tell the server to open a connection towards our machine. Uh, we compile that and we host that on a server, an HTTP server. And then once we deliver the payload, this Java program will be executed and then the connection will be established towards our target machine. So this is the, the whole premise. So getting a reverse shell connection, tricking the targets into connecting towards us instead of reverse, because that wouldn't work uh, because of firewalls. So then, uh, once we've weapon, uh, created our payload, uh, it's just about uh, difficult work, work is done there. Uh, so we just need to execute this vulnerability. So again, listen for the incoming connections, uh, send the request to the server, and then the exploit is triggered. And then once we receive an incoming connection, we have received a shell session, then we know that we are in the machine and that we're connected. Now then, now we have access to the machine, uh, but we have normal user access. But as a hacker, you would want super user or root access to a machine, which means that you can do basically everything uh, on the machine and that you own the machine. And there uh, we look at different uh, privilege escalation techniques. Uh, and most commonly we look for these configurations on, on the server itself or on the machine itself. And this can be, can be uh, quite broad. There's uh, some automated scripts that you can run as a normal user that can look for these misconfigurations 
and usually uh, a hacker could find fairly quickly some misconfigura misconfiguration that they could use. But in this example, for, uh, that's something that you do see in the, in the wild that you can run the sudo uh, on, on bash, which creates a bash from a, uh, a shell as a, as a root user. And if the, the configuration is not properly configured or that specific uh, service is not um, not uh, contains only towards the root user, you could utilize it and then gain root access. So once you have root access, of course, uh, we need to make sure that we remain uh, root and that we remain the owner of that machine. And so the first thing you would do is uh, to change the passwords so that the normal uh, super user or the normal admins cannot access the machine anymore through their root account. Then uh, you of course need to create a stable session, so you would typically then uh, set up an, a separate SSH session to make sure that your uh, your connection is secure and that you are not interrupted in any of the things that you then try to do. And then finally, um, once you've exploited the vulnerability, you are also uh, patching that vulnerability. So this is something that you would a hacker would also typically do uh, in order to prevent that other hackers or other people would exploit that vulnerability again and also might gain access to that same machine. So you really want to contain, create persistence on that machine and make sure that you're not uh, interrupted in, your, uh, in the things that you were trying to do on the server. <laughs> then finally, once you gain uh, command and control over the server, uh, you can do whatever you want on the server. Um, usually, uh, in one server uh, for hackers that's just an entry point into the organization's network so from there you can perform lateral movement and go further into the network try to exploit other machines as well uh, collect sensitive data uh, but also deploy your, your malware or ransomware in the organization so once you've gained an entry point um, this makes a lot of other machines vulnerable uh, depending on yeah, how contained the network is uh, and how the security other machine connections are. So in this case, for example, you could run and deploy a ransomware on this machine and have that spread in, into the organization. So that's briefly uh, how a hacker could use this methodology and use these exploits to gain an entry in the organization. Now, how can we as an organization defend against that? Uh, first of all, uh, firewall. But you would think firewall is the solution in this case, but uh, unfortunately it's not. Um, we saw the payload uh, that we already discussed. Um, it has a general format, so you could easily create a firewall rule that is blocking these types of requests in your internal network. But uh, hackers are of course a bit more creative and there's something called obfuscation, which means that they're making the code unreadable towards humans uh, but still have it interpreted by the servers or by the machines. And so everything you see here down here can potentially lead to the same payload that we see there on top. So it's not that easy uh, to just put in firewall rules and, and stop it in, that, in this way. Uh, and there's in, resulting from that uh, potentially unlimited bypasses, there's always some kind of uh, a pattern that is not being detected by firewall. So what is the good solution? Of course, uh, patching. Uh, and patching is there very important because the criticality that we saw with Log4j uh, is that it's a 10 out of 10, so this means it needs to be patched immediately. Uh, so you need to take immediate action. And what can you do there? Uh, you first need to discover where you are using that specific library. So you can use tools like uh, the Microsoft Defender to, to scan for the specific jar files, class files, and other packages related to Log4j. Uh, check your asset and application inventory if you have that, uh, and then just patch as soon as possible. But what we saw here with this uh, vulnerability is that it's immensely difficult to, to really have a good picture and a good overview of where you're using this library in your organization. And so that's also related to the third party. A lot of organizations rely on third party software providers. How do we know that these, are, these people, these organizations are also delivering 
uh, secure software and that we are not indirectly impacted through there. And this brings us to the sort of the web of dependencies uh, that can be uh, that that many organizations are facing. We have, of course, if we have a direct dependency, uh, in this case to Mock4j, it's usually fairly easy to locate it uh, and to patch it. However, uh, what we see a lot is that uh, yeah, there's nested dependencies. Eh? So uh, packages are referring to other packages, other dependencies. Um, so you could have sort of a nested network of even up to nine levels deep. Uh, where you simply don't know which parts of the software are secure anymore. And this highlights a big issue that, that many organizations didn't realize before the for shell vulnerability. They need to be aware of the dependencies they're using and whether these dependencies are actually secure. Now, what can we do about that? Uh, luckily, there's of course uh, solutions and tools that we can use to uh, to help us with that. Uh, generally, these tools are classified as uh, software composition analysis, uh, really anal analyzing the composition of your software, uh, in this case, open source components in your code base. And this is just a tool that is uh, checking all the dependencies in your, in your code base, in your package managers, uh, source files, artifact repositories, and it generates a report for you. A general tool that is used quite a lot and is also open source is the OWASP dependency check. Uh, and that can already give you fairly quickly an idea of, um, of the dependencies that you're using in your software and if these uh, dependencies have vulnerabilities in there. And so in an ideal situation, you could integrate something like this in your uh, CICD pipeline uh, and then automatically have these uh, have your code base scanned every time that you do a deployment. But uh, this is just a small piece of the picture. Um, nowadays, uh, organizations, like I mentioned, they are relying a lot on third parties, uh, on software providers, on service providers. Uh, and the, the scope, or let's say the, the attack surface of the organization is, is rapidly growing uh, of every organization, basically. The, we've got our infrastructure, which is running in the cloud. We've got applications, web assets. Uh, we have service providers delivering pieces of software. Um, we have our brand reputation that's linked to, the, to our external uh, web assets, for example. So the situation is becoming more and more complex, uh, and we're also relying more and more on, on the different aspects. And for example, service providers are a big issue there. Um, and that's also a trend that we see uh, in, in the last year that hacker groups are not directly targeting uh, organizations anymore. They're specifically targeting software vendors, uh, hardware suppliers, really targeting these people or these organizations that are part of the overall supply chain of a lot of companies. So if you can impact one service provider that's providing software or, or hardware to a lot of other companies, you could have a, an impact that is much larger, larger than if you would uh, target one specific company. And so that's why supply chain attacks uh, are already and, and will become over the years uh, a bigger and bigger issue. Uh, and that's something that uh, yeah, a lot of companies need to shift their focus to. So not only focusing towards their internal security, but also having a broad, broader scope and also looking at the external service, at the, ser at the third party uh, service providers and really making sure that everything that you receive in your uh, organization is also secure. That brings us to the last part, uh, DevOps. Now, as you can see here, a lot of you might already are familiar with this picture. Uh, this is just the classic DevOps uh, life cycle all the way from plan to monitor. Um, but in terms of security, um, me as a security specialist, I'm not really happy with this image because the question is where is security here in this DevOps uh, lifecycle that's been preached to a lot of uh, people? And that's a bit where the, the mindset needs to, to shift that. Uh, instead of 
speaking about DevOps, uh, we should really speak about DevSecOps uh, because security is and, and will become and, and will always be an integral part of your DevOps cycle. Uh, and this is all the way from the beginning. If you're planning to do anything, if you're modeling an, uh, an application, architecting your application, you already need to be aware of what the potential threats could be of your, of your application. Uh, this is really the starting point, making sure your architecture of the application is secure. Then of course, secure coding, um, having your code scanned by static, uh, static application security testing, the dependencies, so software composition analysis, uh, manual code reviews, then once applications are built, you can do some dynamic testing, uh, test some code injection, uh, making sure the application is dynamically tested. Uh, even penetration testing, have an ethical hacker look into the, uh, the application and, and really try to exploit uh, potential vulnerabilities. But then also from the operations side, uh, you need to be aware of uh, the current threats uh, that are going on. Um, for example, last week or, or last couple of weeks um, with the, the, the Russian invasion in Ukraine, we see a lot of um, yeah, a lot of threat intelligence coming in that there are potential uh, yeah, hacker groups uh, that are supported uh, by, by, uh, by countries that are deploying their, their malware and that's specifically targeting certain organizations or certain uh, industries. And so it's, it's good to be aware of, of that aspect and to really make sure that you to act on that, that you know which are your threats and, and how you can defend against them. Then of course also the aspect actively monitoring, detecting and responding to, to potential threats and vulnerabilities uh, and really doing that actively, uh, having a good uh, uh, incident response and recovery uh, plan, really be prepared in case something happens uh, that you can act on that quickly and make sure that your application or your organization stays secure. Now, uh, as a last bit, uh, I'm gonna reflect a bit on, on how we, me in my job at Baldaza, uh, were confronted with this uh, Love for Shell vulnerability. Uh, so we were also alerted from threat intelligence uh, that this vulnerability was detected. Uh, and immediately after that, uh, within our group and our local security incident and response teams, we immediately set up uh, daily calls to uh, discuss this issue and, and identify the potential uh, impacted systems. We also immediately uh, set up some uh, rule sets to filter out from some potential payloads in our firewalls and our other security gateways. Uh, and we started active discovery of that specific Log4j library across our server landscape to make sure that uh, we catch every instance of that uh, library and that we patch it as soon as possible. Uh, then of course for me itself it was a lot of work contacting the DevOps teams, working with them to have these issues patched uh, and then having a fast uh, response to, towards this threat. Then. And finally some lessons that we took from that. Uh, this was the first time that we were faced with, with such uh, an issue that had a direct impact. And so there we learned, yeah, time is of course of the essence. If you're facing with such a critical vulnerability, you can't really wait more than 24 hours to have that patched. So it has to be done immediately. Um, having an up-to-date asset inventory uh, or dependency inventory, whatever, it can be really helpful to quickly identify which servers are vulnerable, where you need to be patching. And finally, also uh, getting more assurance is, is important. So uh, yeah, the software that you receive from third party providers, uh, software uh, vendors, uh, don't blindly trust that software, but be sure that the software that you're using, uh, the information or the, the code that you're receiving is secure uh, and actively scan for vulnerabilities in the code that you receive. Uh, so making sure that you, um, yeah, that you cover your entire IT infrastructure all the way from the beginning, uh, from the code all the way to the operational aspects. So this was my presentation, so uh, I'm not sure if there is any time for questions, but uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.
<coughs> is the entire Log4j crisis diverted now, or are the companies still like? I think most well, of the companies should already have patched uh, because it's been quite a while. Um, so I, I believe most uh, of that crisis is, has been passed. Uh, but again, this is one just one vulnerability, and I'm a bit afraid that this is just the beginning. And this time it's a Java vulnerability, but uh, the next one could be .NET or, or something else. So it's um, this will be an ongoing uh, thing uh, across many organizations. Yeah. What's your idea on the balance between having really, really strict risk and security policies and the freedom to do what you want? Is that like a spectrum? Uh, uh, it depends a bit on the, the environment. It's always a balance uh, between the risk and, and and the cost associated with that. Huh? Uh, security is also about cost. Uh, you have to weigh your cost risks against each other. Um, but in terms of DevOps and, and DevSecOps, um, you have to look at it also differently in terms of uh, security can also help you and enable you to, to have more stable applications. So investing early in the security in the beginning of your development, uh, can you, you can reap the rewards later on because you're uh, you have less time to, once the further uh, vulnerability is found on the process, the, the more expensive it's, it will become. So fixing things early, uh, failing early in the process, uh, will help you build more robust and, and stable applications in, in that sense. Yeah, so Thank you, Matthias, for this uh, interesting presentation.